Um, so here's how this paper came about. I gave a uh, talk at uh, UWO where Genoveva was um, working for, I think, a couple of years. She's no longer there. She's gone back to Barcelona. And uh, she asked me a question at the talk, which was, um, I'll tell you what it is, but it won't mean a whole lot right now. So in the talk I gave, I had established, I thought I had attempted to establish and thought I had established and no one challenged me on that, I had established uh, the first rung of what I'll call a libertine Phrygian hierarchy. And Genoveva asked me, well, how do you get the rest of the hierarchy? And I said, I don't know, Genoveva, how do you get the rest of the hierarchy? <laughs> One month later, she wrote to me and she said, this is how you get the rest of the hierarchy. So um, now what you have before you is a paper or the, uh, an outline of I've completely written. Uh, Genoveva has looked at it once. And she thinks that this is mainly my work, but a key idea is hers. So we're still trying to work out uh, whether this is going to be jointly authored or she's just going to be thanked profusely in the acknowledgments. Okay, so this is one of these rare cases where um, you know, you know, people you acknowledge, uh, you know, they're not responsible for errors, but now even the co-author is not responsible for the errors. It's just me who's responsible for the errors. Okay, so uh, let me start with uh, the overview. So. We're going to draw a conclusion, a very general conclusion, about the nature of concepts and conceptual understanding that's based in considerations from the epistemology of disagreement. Okay, so the key moving parts of the paper and of the view um, are one, that there's a phenomenon of intersubjective opacity that I want to explain. That phenomenon goes on in deep disagreement, and I'm going to be using uh, so you've seen a lot of some philosophy of language, a lot of philosophy of language today. So I'm going to be using a different framework for thinking about this, a different semantic framework. I'm going to be using a Phrygian theory of concepts that draws a distinction between sense and reference. Okay, so the first part of the paper is basically a recap of that paper that I gave at UWO, which uh, constitutes basically the assumptions of the paper. I'm more interested in the extension to generate this uh, infinite libertine hierarchy, um, but uh, everything is open for uh, criticism. So please feel free to um, uh, not just uh, criticize the transition to the conclusion, but also the, the assumptions. So, um, so the assumptions are that deep disagreement manifests this phenomenon of intersubjective opacity, that an ex explanation of this intersubjective opacity can be given at the level of a theory of concepts, that proceeds in terms of positing a distinction between sense and reference, and that this difference in sense constitutes uh, the first rung of a libertine for the hierarchy. The conclusion we want to get is that we can, I want the conclusion of the paper is going to be that we can generalize this phenomenon of intersubjective opacity, and that it entails, this generalized phenomenon, it entails a Phrygian hierarchy that is libertine not only at the first rung, but all the way up the hierarchy. Okay, so uh, at the end of the paper, we'll see how much time we have to do this. I'll compare what uh, I say about intersubjective opacity with uh, Mates' puzzle, which is also a kind of more standard way of arriving at a uh, libertine hierarchy. Okay, so let me begin with um, the background. Okay, so, so it's in deep disagreement that you can find this phenomenon. So what is deep disagreement? So I think deep disagreement has these four uh, features. Uh, some of this has been brought up and um, Jonathan had said some of this stuff and his stuff about foundational disagreements. Um, so uh, here's a slightly um, longer characterization. So deep disagreement I take to be they're fundamental, they're reflective and fully disclosed, they're intractable and they're trenchant. Okay, so what do I mean? They're fundamental in that you can have deep disagreements about anything, but if they're genuinely deep, they're traced back to what I call fundamental norms, principles, or rules. They're sort of basic beliefs or basic rules or basic, basic methodology, uh, concepts involved in thinking about a subject matter. They are reflective and fully disclosed in the sense that the disagreement about fundamental norms, rules, principles that underlie and partially um, explain the original disagreement are not only there to be seen from the theorist's perspective, but from the participants to the disagreement, from their perspective. Okay? 
Okay, so uh, participants to the disagreement come to recognize that this disagreement is really goes deep in their um, in their uh, respective thinking. They are intractable, not in the sense that they're irresolvable, but in the sense that it's difficult to make progress in resolving the disagreement because uncontested traction in the other's conflicting perspective is difficult to achieve. They are trenchant in that disagreement does not lead to conciliation, but remains uncompromising and committed, and can be or can be expected to be long-standing. One thing I should have said at the beginning, so I don't want you to read past page three, is because when I get to page three, I'm going to ask you if you can tell me how to generalize the phenomenon. Okay, so I couldn't figure it out when Genevieve asked me, but maybe you will. So you can look ahead, but then you won't, you won't be able to uh, take a stab at answering the question. Okay, so, um, so now I think reflection, you know, this is, should be argued in more detail, but like I said, this is an, there's another paper on this, but reflection on the nature of deep disagreement um, suggests that it's governed by norms that somehow allow at least a weak permission to persist in confidence um, in, in the face of the disagreement. Okay, so I think it's, it's some of the things going on here, are like considerations from the perspective of the other party to the disagreement, that they fail to engage participants' attitude fully and robustly. It's like you have this deep disagreement and you're not exactly sure how to get them to change your mind or how, why you should change your mind. Um, it's been, uh, because it's been fully disclosed, you know why they think what they think. They know why you think what you think why you think what you think, you've been over it many times, you've seen the moves. Um, the rational motivation to lower confidence in response to disagreement, even if there is one, it's kind of unspecific and abstract. You're like, you know, that doesn't really touch my view, uh, that kind of thing. So to, to get the real contrast, just contrast with ordinary disagreements like shares of the dinner bill or you know, being at a horse race and being at the finish line and trying to decide who won the horse race. So in those cases, I think it's completely appropriate to lower confidence and uh, you know, reopen the question, as Michaela had said, um, recalculate, acquire new evidence, you can do all those things. But in these deep disagreements, none of that stuff has worked. You've already tried all that stuff. You're way past that. Okay? So the point of full disclosure in deep disagreement was you want to understand the perspective of the other party of the disagreement. You want to get into their point of view to understand why they hold the view that they hold. Okay, now how does the distinction between sense and reference enter the explanation of the norms of deep disagreement? Okay, so I want to say it's important, this is relevant to um, Carrie's talk and to Chris McFann's talk, so I want to say it's not in the most obvious way. So I think there's a way you can bring, um, you know, uh, differences in meaning or differences in sense into issues about disagreement that um, you can bring them in too early. Okay, so I'm very, um, I, I want to make sure I don't bring it in too early. You'll see what I mean. So the most obvious way is to say, look, participants to the disagreement are thinking thoughts that have distinct senses as constituents, distinct meanings. But the problem with that is bringing in sense at that level is that what you get then is you get equivocation and you lose the disagreement. Okay, so to see that in the simplest kind of Frege puzzle type case, right? if I believe that Hesperus is Hesperus and you doubt that Hesperus is Phosphorus, we're not really in any rational tension in, in the sense that's relevant to the epistemology of disagreement. And that's because there are different modes of presentation or senses involved in our thoughts. So how does the distinction enter? So here I want to emphasize that I'm talking about deep disagreements that are reflective and fully disclosed. Okay, so the conceptualizations in deep disagreement involve thinking about one's own thoughts and, and one's own mind and others' minds, and in particular about the concepts and thoughts with which oneself and the other party of the disagreement thinks about the subject matter. Okay, so you've semantically ascended. You're now thinking about your mind, not only thinking about the subject matter, but thinking about your mind, thinking about your, um, the other part of this, about their mind. <coughs> so the distinction between sense and reference enters the explanation by allowing distinct modes of presentation of one and the same thought. Okay, so you've semantically ascended, now you're thinking about the propositional objects of um, the, uh, your own thoughts and the other part of the disagreement, her thoughts, and the idea is that there's a sense reference distinction to be invoked here that there are distinct modes of presentation of one and the same thought, I'm believing it, the other part of the disagreement is doubting it, but there are different, those thoughts are being presented 
to um, my mind in distinct ways, that my thought and the <coughs> thought of the other party to the disagreement. Okay. Um, so these I'll call modes of meta-representation. So they're modes of presentation of thoughts or representations themselves. So I think these can help explain the norms of deep disagreement. Okay. So um, now here's one, here's, so uh, this is a connection to some of Rafe Wedgwood's work. So I think, you know, lots of people have this idea, or a few people have this idea that uh, perspective is important for uh, getting a what's called a steadfast or a dogmatic view in the epistemology of disagreement. And I think that's right. I think perspective is important for that. Um, but I don't think it's important because somehow my perspective has some sort of leg up in the dispute. So I think Rafe calls this, um, he calls this an egocentric epistemic uh, egoism. No, e e what do you call it? E e egoistic, what, what is it? Some sort of for some sort of uh, uh, privilege for one's own point of view. Okay. So I don't think that's how it goes. So perspective is important for a steadfast view, but it's not, it doesn't come in that way. It comes in instead in explaining the kind of intersubjective opacity and deep disagreement. Okay. So I think there's a special problem of reconstructing conflicting perspectives in, in deep disagreement. So in a reconstruction of somebody else's point of view, you can get to you know, the fundamental basis of the disagreement. So you can sort of, you can get to, um, um, you know, whatever you, what, what we would ordinarily say, like sort of what underlies the disagreement. Here's the, the fundamentals of our disagreement, right? But I'm interested not stopping at that point, but understanding why a conflicting perspective will accept those differing principles. So you get down to the fundamental basis. Now there's still a question, well, why do you hold that while I hold this? Okay, so there's still a question to be answered at this point. Um, so I think here what happens is that a move that is usually you need some special reasons to invoke comes up and becomes a um, move that is, you're perfectly entitled to uh, avail yourself of. And that's to suspect that in the disagreement there's some equivocation going on. Okay, so it's very familiar from philosophical disagreements. It's been mentioned in the um, conference a number of times where people say, you know, you have that view and I have no, I don't understand how you have that kind of view. Okay, so I think there's this phenomenon where you think that, you know, wait, we disagree, but I'm a little worried that in fact our disagreement is only apparent and not real because there's the possibility of an equivocation. Now, of course, I'm interested because I'm interested in disagreement. I'm interested in the case where there in fact isn't an equivocation. And in fact, we really are taking differing attitudes to one and the same thought. But to our reflective thinking, our, um, these thoughts are being presented to my reflective thinking, these thoughts are being presented in different ways. Okay. Now, in the Phrygian framework, this suspicion, indeed its possibility, is captured as a distinction in sense or uh, uh, mode of presentation of a referent, where the referent here is a thought. It's not an ordinary object, it's a thought. Okay. So how does this explain the mode, uh, the sort of norm? The idea is that, look, in a deep disagreement, the rational stress that uh, another person's conflicting opinion would produce on your mind is garbled or is sort of opaque to you because it's not transfer transferred across points of view cleanly. That gives you the weak permission to persist in confidence in your own opinion. You're just like not sure whether their evaluation of the evidence and their view is really in tension with yours. That's an open question. Okay. Now, so that's sort of the epistemology of disagreement and that's very quick and like I said, I've got a 40 page paper for those who are interested in reading the details about that. Okay, so uh, what's the significance of this for uh, a theory of concepts or theory of sense? Okay, so I want to say that these things, so, um, so this difference is based in perspective. My own thought is presented to me in a distinct way from the other person's thought. So I call these perspectival modes of meta-representation. So they're modes of, modes of presentation of thoughts, so they're modes of meta-representation that are partially individuated by perspective, by whose thought I'm thinking about. They're the propositional object of my thought, of my thinking, or of your thinking. Okay, so I'm going to say that these perspectival modes of meta-representation 
constitute the first rung of a libertine Phrygian hierarchy. So what is the Phrygian hierarchy of senses? Okay, so I, won't, I don't want to spend too long on this, but just to keep everybody on board, which is really important to me. So the way this is usually explained is in terms of the semantics of propositional attitude reports. The idea is that take an unembedded <coughs> sentence like Superman flies, there Superman refers to the guy Superman, flies picks out the property of flying. Um, Frege has a distinction between two kinds of uh, semantic relation that um, expressions stand in to various semantic entities. So there's the referring to an object and there's expressing a sense. Okay, so in Superman Flies, you refer to Superman and you express a, the sense of the expression Superman. In embedding that sentence in a propositional attitude report, like Lois believes that Superman flies, um, on Frege's view, Frege thinks that in, in such a case, the, uh, sup the expression Superman, or the occurrence of the expression Superman, now refers to its usual sense, its customary sense, and expresses a higher order sense called the indirect sense. That indirect sense is a mode of presentation of the referent, which is now the customary sense. Okay? So you have a mode of presentation of a representation. Okay, so that's customary reference, that's the reference unembedded, that's customary sense, that's the sense expressed in the unembedded case, then there is the customary sense also becomes the referent in the embedded case, and the indirect sense is the sense expressed in the um, embedded case. Okay, so that's the background on Frege there. Okay, so this, the indirect sense expressed in the context of propositional attitude verb that is the first rung of, the, of a Phrygian hierarchy. So not libertine yet, just a Phrygian hierarchy. Ascent up the hierarchy then is a matter of the occurrence of the expression in further embeddings. Okay, so you embed in one attitude verb, you get uh, the customary sense is the referent, the indirect sense is, the, is what's expressed. You embed in another attitude verb, the indirect sense becomes the referent, the second indirect <laughs> sense becomes the sense expressed. And now you're on your way up the hierarchy. Okay, now what is a libertine hierarchy of sense? A libertine hierarchy, so this is Ter Terence Parsons' phrase, what is a libertine hierarchy of sense? A libertine hierarchy is to be contrasted with a rigid hierarchy. Okay, so it's easier to explain a rigid hierarchy, so I'll explain that first. A rigid hierarchy is a hierarchy in which the relation between senses of order n greater than or equal to 2, so that's the indirect sense, and higher. Um, that relation is one-to-one, -one. okay? So what you have is you have an expression, okay, so you have, you have a referent, you can have distinct modes of presentation of the referent, and then if you have a rigid hierarchy, the modes of presentation of the sense, they just go straight up, one-to-one, -one. okay? If you have a libertine hierarchy, then that relation between higher order senses and the senses that they are senses of is many-to-one, or can be many-to-one. Okay, so that's a libertine hierarchy. So you get the branching structure um, potentially all the way up. Okay. Now, just to sort of really sort of dig your teeth into these notions, here are some consequences of the different kinds of hierarchies. Okay, so a rigid hierarchy is a hierarchy in which the okay, I already said that. A rigid hierarchy has the following consequence: if expressions E1 and E2 express the same sense then they express the same higher order senses all the way up the hierarchy. Okay, so if it's rigid and two expressions express the same sense, then they'll continue to do so all the way up the hierarchy. A libertine hierarchy has the following consequence. Two expressions, E1 and E2, can express the same customary and higher order senses up to level N. So you can go up to a certain level, but then you can st still diverge okay, higher up and higher. So now here's a distinction that's mainly important for the third section of the paper, but I like making it and it's good to make now. So I want to make a distinction between the expression of the different kinds of hierarchy, rigid or libertine, in language versus the hierarchies of sense themselves. Okay, so there's a hierarchy of these abstract objects, and then there's the expression of those hierarchies in language. And I'm mainly concerned with the hierarchies of sense themselves. I'm interested in those abstract objects. 
Okay? And sometimes it's useful to you know, see those structures exemplified in language, but really I'm interested in the senses themselves. Okay? And those things have a cognitive nature. They are um, what they are in terms given uh, facts about cognitive significance and cognitive value. Okay, so this is just Frege's puzzle. The idea is that Hesperus and Phosphorus, exp those expressions, I'll put it that way to begin with, um, express distinct senses because they have different cognitive value. They, what they mean has a different meaning for you in your mind. Okay. So you want to, if you want to see this distinction at the sort of simple Frege's puzzle level, Right. Sometimes Frege's puzzle is put as a puzzle about the semantics of expressions. It's like, okay, how can expressions or how can sentences that differ in just having one expression substitute for another, even though those expressions have the same referent, how can they differ in truth value? Like Lois Lane believes that Superman flies versus Lois Lane believes that Clark Kent flies. Those just substituting uh, co-referential expressions, yet you have a, it looks like you have a change in truth value. Okay, so that's a kind of linguistic puzzle, and you, sense can be invoked to explain it, to answer it. On the second kind of version, this is the kind of version of the puzzle that I think I always start with when I teach, is I say, look, it's a cognitive puzzle. It's like, how can, um, it, can be, how can it be rational for Lois to believe that Superman flies, but to doubt that Clark Kent flies? So there I'm asking about rational status, I'm asking about how it is that these thoughts can have this different cognitive significance. And how it is we can explain her rational status by appealing to the nature of her thoughts. And so that's a puzzle about rational status, a puzzle about cognitive significance, about cognitive value. It's not about language. Okay. Now, what do uh, perspectival modes of representation show about the hierarchy? Okay, so here you have to make another distinction. And, um, what, how am I doing for time? I hope I'm doing You have lots of time, right? 12 minutes. 12 minutes. <laughs> oh, my God. That's terrible. Okay, I'm going to skip uh, this whole bit uh, about... Um, Sorry to be the bearer of bad that, news. That is really a bearer of bad news. Yeah. Time flies when the speaker's having fun. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, okay. Okay, look. So here's the idea. So I can put this in very intuitively. Okay, so what we have so far is we've got these deep disagreements and we've got these distinct modes of presentation of one and the same thought. Okay, so I'm going to say what we've got there is the first step up a libertine hierarchy. Okay, because you have multiple modes of presentation um, picking out a single representation. You have multiple indirect senses picking out uh, uh, a single sense. Okay, so that's what we get out of the deep disagreement. So now the question is, that's the first rung of the hierarchy. How do we generalize? Any answers? Okay, that was my position. Okay, okay. So now here is the uh, one sentence of the paper written by Genoveva in an email to me. Um, it's under three generalizing. Okay, so I'll tell you. I'll tell you when Genoveva starts speaking. We describe and analyze. Okay, so we're going to give an example. In the example. So this is now Genoveva. There is a, again a disagreement, but in this case the disagreement is not about some subject matter, but rather about the views of some third party on some subject matter. Okay, so now I've got an example, which I won't go through in great detail because it'll take up a bunch of time. Okay, here's the example. Wittgenstein on the identity symbol and logically perfect languages. Okay, so suppose that Genoveva and I had a dispute about whether the identity symbol should be included in a logically perfect language. Okay, suppose we had a deep disagreement about that, and now you can use that to instantiate the first part of my paper. Suppose we resolve that dispute. Then we, but upon resolving the dispute, we realize, oh, wait a sec, we actually have a deep disagreement about Wittgenstein. We have a deep disagreement about whether Wittgenstein believes that the identity symbol is, should be part of a logically um, perfect language. Okay, so we know, we're no longer disputing whether or not the identity symbol is part of a logically perfect language. We are now disputing whether Wittgenstein believes that the identity symbol is part of a logically perfect language. Okay, so I think that Genoveva is right, and I've, in the rest of this section I try to explain why that constitutes the next rung 
of a libertine hierarchy. Okay, so let me try to pick out the most important features of that uh, dispute. So we have this deep disagreement about whether what Wittgenstein believes on this, and I articulate some, you know, just sort of like, I'm just kind of making things up in that little thing there, but just to indicate there's some deep disagreement between us. Okay, so, so I think what you have to do is you have to pay attention to the conceptual resources that are involved in this disagreement. I'm going to call this a little later on, I'll do it now. Call this, call the first kind of disagreement a deep factual disagreement. Call this a deep interpretive disagreement. Okay, so um, we want to look at what conceptual resources are involved in deep interpretive disagreements. Okay, so in a deep interpretive disagreement, I reflectively believe the following. That I believe, that Wittgenstein believes that the identity symbol is part of a logically perfect language, and that Genoveva doubts that Wittgenstein believes that the identity symbol is part of a logically perfect language. Um, so this is B, 5B here is important. When I reflectively think about my disagreement with Genoveva, I think not only about the subject matter, about the identity symbol of logically perfect languages, and not only about my own and Genoveva's thoughts about the subject matter, about the thought that the identity symbol is a part of a logically perfect language, but also about my own and Genoveva's thoughts about Wittgenstein's thoughts about the subject matter, about the thought that Wittgenstein believes that the identity symbol is part of a logically perfect language. Okay, so in all these cases, we think about these things with concepts or senses. We think about the subject matter with concepts of those things that we're thinking about, logically perfect languages and the identity symbol. We think about um, our disagreement, the thoughts we're thinking in our disagreement with concepts of those thoughts that we're thinking. And we think about our disagreement about what Wittgenstein thinks with concepts of those, of the thought that Wittgenstein thinks that, or, sorry, this is why I have this, this is why I have an elaborate handout. Uh, in disagreement, uh, where am I? In disagreement about what Wittgenstein thinks about the subject matter, we think about our thoughts about Wittgenstein's thoughts about the subject matter with concepts of those thoughts about Wittgenstein's thoughts about the subject matter. Okay, the cognitive significance or value of these, so now, 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 what's the cognitive significance or value of these conceptual resources? Okay, because so I think I'm going to be stopping at the end of section two, so that would be great. So do I have a few more minutes for that? Yep. Yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah, I'll leave the stuff on Maid's Puzzle on. Okay, so because our disagreement is deep, there can be a reflective suspicion of equivocation that we are, a reflective suspicion that we are interpreting Wittgenstein's <laughs> own understanding of the thought that the, uh, that the identity symbol is part of a logically perfect language in different ways. We're afraid we're equivocating on what Wittgenstein, how Wittgenstein understands the thought that uh, the identity symbol is part of a logically perfect language. We disagree over, as we might put it loosely, what the thought that the identity symbol is a part of a logically perfect language means for Wittgenstein. Oh, okay, okay, good. So since we suspect equivocation, right, so this is again going to be a distinction in modes of presentation. Um, since we suspect equivocation in our understanding of how Wittgenstein understood the thought, that the identity symbol is part of a logically perfect language, my concept of my own thought about Wittgenstein's thoughts about the subject matter must be distinct from my concept of Genoveva's thoughts about Wittgenstein's thoughts about the subject matter. There is a distinction in mode of presentation of the thought that Wittgenstein believes that the identity symbol is part of a logically perfect language. Okay, so I think again, this distinction in cognitive significance, this distinction in mode of uh, uh, representation is explanatory of some of the norms. Okay, so, so here's one idea. Look, if we think that deep factual disagreements have a permissive normativity, that is, that you can persist in confidence in a deep disagreement, then I think it's pretty plausible that deep interpretive disagreements have a uh, permissive normativity. Okay, so this the same explanation for the permissive normativity of the deep factual disagreement will carry over to the explanation of the permissive normativity of the deep interpretive disagreement. Okay, but that doesn't really capture the importance of the libertine hierarchy. Okay, so here's the importance of the libertine character of the hierarchy. When we are having a dispute about what Wittgenstein believes about the matter, right, we've got to recognize that there are these different points at which we can be 
equivocated. We can that we're that we're worried about interpretation. Right? We can be worried that we are equivocating. We can be worried that we're not thinking, um, we're not interpreting the thought in the same way. But we can also be worried, not that we're not interpreting the thought in the same way, but that we're not interpreting what Wittgenstein thought about the subject matter in the same way. That's not that. So Genoveva and I could agree, oh yeah, this is what that thought comes down to. This is the analysis of that thought. This is what that thought means. But still disagree about what, what Wittgenstein thought that that thought means. Okay, and we need to mark that distinction. We need to mark that difference in cognitive significance. And so you do that with the, um, with the hierarchy. Okay, so the presence of differing conceptualizations at different levels in the Freudian framework is a step up a libertine hierarchy. And now we keep going. Okay. For example, we may also disagree about whether Wittgenstein believes that Frege believes that the identity symbol is part of a logically perfect language. The disagreement takes us up another ring of a libertine hierarchy, and so on. Okay, that's it. So, uh, I found this a really interesting application of fairly technical ideas and philosophy of language to a socially and politically relevant topic, which is not something you see very often. Um, and the semantics of, so, okay, let's, let me just jump straight to comments. So, there's something a little strange, not strange, a little sort of an internal tension in, in the semantics of deep disagreement. So, meaningful disagreement, this is a familiar point, meaningful disagreement at all is only possible if there's a broad background of agreement. This is a familiar point from Wittgenstein and Davidson, if that's your cup of tea, or from Gadamel, if you work on the other side of the aisle. Um, and um, at the same time, <clears throat> when there's a, a deep disagreement, not a disagreement about you know, whether it's raining outside or the windows are just grimy, right? some deeper disagreement, uh, there's, there's a sense that, um, that the two sides are not speaking quite the same idiom. Might be speaking the same language from a linguistic point of view. Uh, but it's not quite the same. So this is not the equivocation where, no, actually we agree if we just understood each other's concepts uh, correctly, or other, each other's use of language correctly. No, we, we definitely disagree. Uh, but we disagree in part because, I think, uh, sometimes we're just not using the same idiom. So here's an example to, to, to get at what I'm, to, to show what I'm getting at, and, and maybe you can, you can speak to that. Uh, let's say radical disagreement between someone who is pro-choice, someone on abortion, and somebody who says abortion is murder. Um, this is not a disagreement about factual matters. This is a deep disagreement. And it seems to me, at least, that it's also a disagreement about meaning, not just a disagreement about, uh, presumably, both people agree that, yes, definitely murder is bad. No disagreement there. But we disagree on what it means for, I don't know, a fertilized egg or a fetus and so on to be uh, a person or life or not life and so on and so forth. So we're disagreeing on concepts here as well as on ethical principles, perhaps like the importance of uh, bodily autonomy and control over your own body and so on and so forth. But in addition to that, there seems to be a conceptual difference. Um, and uh, in, in, the, in the paper, I think you haven't uh, quite brought that out in, in, the, in your spoken comments now, but in the paper you talk a lot about norms and disagreeing on norms, and I think that this kind of deep disagreement resonates with the Wittgensteinian discussion of rule following. Namely, if I'm asked to give reasons, okay, but why, but why, but why, at some point as he says, my spade is turned, I hit bedrock, I can just shrug and say, I don't know what to tell you, this is just what we do. If you, if you still don't see it, there's nothing I'm going to say that's going to make you see it at this point. So, what I like about your, your analysis, among other things, is that uh, you're offering a much more fine-grained analysis of where the breakdown in communication happens. Right? Not just at some point of my state is turned and say, look, we're just not talking the same language. Yes, but that doesn't go far enough, and I think that this helps us go further, and that's, I think, very helpful. But at the same time, I don't want to put some pressure on this, on 
how exactly this hierarchy of meta representations is, is set up. So let's say I have, so we disagree, and so I reflect on our disagreement. So I think about my thoughts, and I think about your thoughts, and I think about um, how to, well, the, the point is, I think I have to think about how to translate your thoughts to my own idiom in order to make sense of it. So I'm not sure, in other words, that, that, that this hierarchy does in fact build up more than two levels or so. So let's take a, a very simple example of, of, uh, of uh, translation. Suppose, I don't know, we're sitting at the, at the table and someone next to you says, don't uh, le stilo. And let's assume you don't speak any French, excuse me. And somebody helpfully translates, he asks you to give him the pen. So, no problem, right? So I think something similar to that is happening where I try to make sense of some, let me take a different example. You're talking to some you know, hard libertarian who says taxation is theft. Or if you prefer the other side, somebody with a sort of far left position says uh, private property is banditry. I'm deliberately taking caricatures. Okay, so you want to make sense of the other person is not being ridiculous. You want to have respectful disagreement. So you translate their idiom in your head. Okay, what would make somebody say taxation is theft? Well, they must think that taxation is this, that, and the other thing. Therefore, it would make sense if it, that is what taxation were. It would be theft. Of course, I don't agree that that's what taxation is. I've located our disagreement by translating what it is that we are, by, by diagnosing where our communication broke down. Because I can't have a sensible discussion on cost-benefit analysis of social policy with someone who thinks that all taxation is debt. That's the wrong place to have, that's not a discussion, right? So where did it break down? Here's where it broke down. It doesn't mean we'll get any agreement, but at least we can see where it breaks down. So it seems like we don't need this big hierarchy. It seems like I just internally translate into my own idiom. And so when I think about my thoughts, or when we have a disagreement about an interpretation. So I think about, I'm trying to see why would you interpret Wittgenstein as saying that? Okay, because I guess you understand Wittgenstein to be saying this and the other thing, therefore it makes sense to you to say that whatever. So you see, I've translated your line of thinking into my own idiom, thereby making sense of it without necessarily agreeing with it, but it doesn't seem like you need more than two levels, the discourse and the meta-discourse, and I doesn't, I'm not sure you need a meta-meta discourse, meta-meta, right? It seems like the meta-discourse can just become object-level discourse while still only staying in a two-level uh, uh, sort of two level picture. So uh, this is not meant to knock down your argument at all. This is an invitation to um, clarify um, and, and to, to say, okay, how does this picture actually help us make sense of these kinds of examples. Right? So again, thank you for the paper and thank you for your attention.